of uh, environmental investigations editor for an initiative that's called the Rainforest uh, Investigations Network. And this work that I'm doing there with the Pulitzer Center, it's a lot uh, based on the experience of, of geojournalism that I'm going to talk with you, which is the use of, of geodata. It's as we can say it's a, a kind of a data journalist that is focused more on the use of geographic data. And the reason for that is that once we are uh, reporting about the environment, talking about geography, it, it's quite the, the natural thing to do. And so the, the work that I'm going to share here today, it's pretty much based on the experience I developed with uh, uh, Info Amazonia, which is a news website um, that I founded with uh, other colleagues uh, here in Brazil. But the, the aim of this website is to cover the nine countries of the Amazon. I'm gonna talk more about this, the Amazon rainforest. But I, I do believe that, and I hope that the things that I'm gonna share here today can be useful for any environmental reporting that we you intend to do. Because if we are talking about climate change <clears throat> and the issues of environmental impact like uh, deforestation or uh, pollution, our role as journalists is pretty much to study or to report or to depict the territory, the, the environment, right? I usually say that if you reporting about the environment, your main character is the, is the environment, right? The environment is always present. The ecosystem or the river or the mountain or the forest, this is a part of your story. This is a character that you should um, bring to the forefront to your audience and and one way of uh, uh, portraying this environment is using data that's why we'll be talking about a lot about data today data sources data stories and tools for you uh, doing your work so it's a great pleasure i'm i'm sorry we don't have the time to go around and listening to uh, from each one of you participants and would love to know more about your experience but it, by the end of the, the presentation i'm going to share my contacts and i'll be happy to be in contact and, and answer any questions that we didn't manage we, we don't manage to to cover on this presentation allow me to share the the screen I have a presentation here Go back to the first one. Okay. Uh, let me know if you have any issues on, on seeing the screen, but I'm supposing that the things were working fine. All right. I was discussing with uh, Kieran in preparation for this session that um, we will talk about uh, maps and, and climate change. I will uh, focus on some examples uh, of my own work and of other people's work. Uh, but when we have the the question sessions, I would love to to know more. How can I help on other other um, issues and in other ecosystems as well? But let me start by just making the case of why using geographic data in journalism. If we reporting about the climate change, for example, the the first uh, challenge that we have is dealing with scales of time and space that are very different that we normally deal with. Uh, and, and, and that's puts us right in the middle of the discussion of, of, of the geographic methodology, right? Because if you think about uh, the sciences that study the earth or, or the environment, they all dealing with time series that are much longer than our times, uh, our time frame for journalism. We usually reporting about things that happened uh, today or yesterday or during the past week, while the scientists are always looking at much longer time scales. And same thing for the, the space, right? If you think about journalism, a lot is, is, is based on a kind of a restricted geographic 
uh, framework is always like a country or a region or even a city, like a hyper-local newspaper or website or radio. But if we're talking about um, ecosystems like I do when I talk about the Amazon basin, I'm talking about a huge area that has challenges that are going over time, like the first station, for example, is happening over the past 50 or 40 years. And look at this image, for example, on the, on the screen. This is showing almost 40 years of data uh, to, to uh, portray how climate change is affecting glaciers. Uh, and, the, and, and that's very effective. I don't need to tell a super long story to uh, depict 40 years of a phenomenon. So that's why when we're using uh, satellite imagery, for example, which is exactly a kind of geographic data, we're getting help for facing this challenge of showing a long time scale and a, uh, a big uh, geographic uh, space. We're looking in a large scale. That's one of the reasons. And why mixing this geographic data with journalists, which give us this idea of geojournalism, which is approaching the journalism of the geographic practice of geographic science. The reason for that is that we gain this capacity of looking at much longer uh, time frame or time scale and, and a much uh, bigger uh, geographic scope. And the other thing is that if you mixing this perspectives, you know, you is like you get the, the skills of reporting from the ground to the to the sky or from the space. What I want to mean is that the, the technique of geojournalism is thinking that a story has this different resolutions, right? From this from the ground, the minimal resolution where you have your story, doing your interviews, listening to your sources making uh, local pictures and combining this with a much broader perspective which is looking from the sky with a satellite uh, imagery or a map it's pretty much like that uh, tool that we have in many many maps uh, interactive maps that allow you to zoom in and zoom out right to have the local perspective and getting a, a regional relevance but um, I believe you, you, you understand or you perceive that this is also very common in, in journalism. This is a technique that we've been using for years, which is giving one case and then zooming out and showing how this case is actually connected to many other cases. Uh, and that's um, usual, right? Like you're saying like, well, every morning this person wakes up and drinks a cup of coffee and then you zoom out and say like him or her thousands of people around the world drink coffee every morning which means that then you zooming out and giving the relevance of that single case for the the whole uh, universe or the whole sample if you like um what are, what we do when we reporting on the environment is the same technique we tell that case on the ground and then we zoom out and give the relevance the thing is the language of interactive maps is becoming so much more common years ago when i was starting to do um, this kind of journalism using interactive maps for my reporting um, i got some feedback from a friend saying like well looks beautiful but i don't really relate i don't i cannot uh, use interactive maps they look really um, not intuitive to me and I understood at that point that it was it was a very valid um, very valid feedback showing to me that uh, not any not everybody was uh, keen to use interactive maps on the other hand over the the past 10 years we've been seeing that uh, app applications like Google Maps or Waze or many others are very much based on using interactive maps, which makes me think that the language of interactive maps, and that's a claim that I will make or an argument or a point 
uh, point of view that I will defend, the language of interactive maps might be one of, one of the newest and most current language, visual language or communication language adopted in recent years in large scale. Many people know how to use it. The pandemic just has deepened this, this trend. And so if we're reporting on the environment, if we want to tell the story of one territory, it makes total sense to use interactive maps more and more. And how you how how do you use this in a practical way, in a visual way? So you have, in my view, after doing this for many years, creating a kind of layer mindset where your stories are going to be part of the of the of the uh, of the representation of the territory. It's going to be one more layer. What what I mean is that you take one territory, one space, it can be one protected area, it can be one city. By the way, if you, uh, if you want to follow this presentation in a very effective way, I would propose you that you think about one place that you would like to tell a story about. Think about this place as a character, like a person. If you want to make a profile of a person, what are the characteristics of that person that you're going to look for if you want to do a profile of a place report on the environment what are the characteristics of this place that you're going to look for in so in the case of one uh, single household what are the consumption of water that's one later layer what is the consumption of energy this is another layer what is the coverage of green uh, space or vegetation or the number of trees that are planted in, in that household. And then you come with your story and then you help to contextualize that data. Who are the people who lived in that household? Can we do interviews with them and, and, and create the layer of stories, a collection of stories about that territory that will help to contextualize the data. And the data will always be there to contextualize your stories is like a dialogue between these layers. These are all, or my sound, uh, really um, theoretical, but I will show you now some examples of how this works in practice, and I hope this will inspire you to do similar work. To start, think about if we if we're talking about geojournalism, we colliding, if you like, two practices: geographic science. And journalists, and what are the the techniques or the, the analysis more frequent in geographic uh, sciences that we can bring to journalists? So think about the resolution. Start uh, selecting a resolution for your story. It can be a local story. It can be a regional story. It can be a ecosystem story. Telling the story of the whole ecosystem. Or if you're talking about climate change, you're even doing a global story. That's the, the highest resolution so far for a journalist. It seems like that we uh, soon jumping out of the planet and doing spatial resolution as well, and others kind of spatial resolution from the space. Uh, but then you think about, so resolution deals with the, with the space in a sense of the geographic space. But there's, then you have to think about time scale. What kind of, a, of analysis you do when you're thinking about time? You think about the frequency, um, besides the when, right? When the fact uh, happened, when this deforestation happened, when the glacier has melted, there's the, this. There's the frequency, right? How often things happen, that's very uh, uh, usual to analyze, for example, forest fires that is a growing effect of climate change or floods or extreme events, how frequent extreme events happen or the duration of, a, of an event, how long it lasts or how long it, it took to transform something, right? Uh, and finally, the changes before and after. It's pretty much like I said, like if you're talking about a person you want to see how this person has changed over their years, how they, they got 
different if they get uh, fatter or they lost some weight that's the the person who's talking about the environment who want to see if they lost vegetation if there was more water less water that's the kind of things that you were looking at that person and and how fast or slow those changes ha has happened uh have happened and so and finally you have the the analysis that you can do about the space as well in terms of like how distant something is what's the size of an area and how things intersect which is when the most interesting analysis happen for example how many forest fires happen in within a, a protected area these kind of things i will talk to you uh, talk about the, the example of info amazonia the work that i've, I've been doing um, in this region in the past uh, 10 years and and I hope uh, illustrates a bit of this idea um, representing things. Um, if we're talking about representing a territory, of course, the language, again, of doing this is by using maps, right? The maps are, are the best uh, picture of uh, territory. And that's why the language of maps, the language of cartography, it's so useful for us. <clears throat> So my character, the person I want to uh, depict, I want to portray to you is this region called Amazonia, or the Amazon rainforest. And there are some basic facts. Look at the size of this. This is actually as big as uh, as the uh, the countries of the European Union. So we're looking at the territory as big as the European Union here. Uh, but the difference is that while the European Union has um, more countries and, and population. Here we're talking a population that is ten times smaller than in the European Union, and all 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 the Amazon is contained only within nine countries. Although it's so big, it doesn't have like twenty five countries like the European Union it has nine countries. These are the nine countries, and then we start putting layers to understand what what makes this territory so special. Look at this. These are all the indigenous territories that exist in these nine countries. You can see the trends by just looking at this image, how Peru is dense in terms of uh, indigenous communities, while uh, bigger uh, areas you can find probably in Brazil, Venezuela. Um, and here's uh, some facts that are very interesting about this territory where 27% are, are made out of, of indigenous population 400 different ethnicities and and some of them still consider isolated without contact with the modern modern society which is very interesting to to think about it right at this point in our lives where we're so dependent on facebook and whatsapp we still have people who never actually wanted to make contact with our civilization uh, so this is one aspect of the amazon uh, and then i can show you other layers that are equally interesting. If I want to then see what is the the forest there, I bring this other layer. Here I have two layers mix actually. One is the height of the forest. It's a satellite imagery that gives you this uh, beautiful green color that is the forest itself. But then there is the layer of deforestation over 30 years. Again, if I want to tell a story that has happened over the 30 years, the map can do this really well instead of me just <clears throat> showing all the trends with, with text. And by just looking at this map, I know that the, the most affected areas during this time are the areas in the um, east part of Brazil, where uh, the, the major influx of economic investment and migration happened over the years. So that's why you have this strong deforestation. The resolution here doesn't allow you to see the trends in other countries because they're much smaller than in Brazil, but they're happening and you barely can see, but in, in Colombia, there is a, a, a strong area of deforestation as well as in Peru. So this is another layer to represent this character of mine that is the Amazon. Talking about frequency and how things happen, I was mentioning forest fires, forest fires or or fires in general. Um, it's it's a very good thermometer 
indicator of the health of an environment. Here is just a loop <clears throat> to show you how we do things um, in the Info Amazonia, but that's a good image to show um, uh, how you can work with re almost real time data coming from, from satellites. This data is uh, updated every 24 hours. So you can show the cycle over the of the year or, or that specific week and how it has been changing over the territory. So you're really giving a live picture of your your character, how this character has been changing in a very short period of time and how it's being affected by phenomena that are increasing in intensity because of climate change. But of course, you, you, you then think about that technique that I was just mentioning, the zoom in and zoom out. Uh, looking at from the space using real-time satellite data, you're looking through maps and giving this overview. That's still not enough for the journalism, right? That's one aspect. You're looking at the data, giving a visualization, you allowing people to see the whole trend and having an overview. But we want to zoom in. We wanted to go down to the ground and show with pictures, which is a great picture from a fan called Victor that uh, it's made by airplane. Then you already closer to the to the terrain and giving you the concretude coming out of the map and showing to people how this looks in practice. So those forest fires that look somehow beautiful with the satellite data in this map, they get a, a much more concrete feeling with this picture, aerial picture taken from an airplane and how it looks on the ground and why you even can see the smoke from the sky if you if you use satellite imagery, but that gives you more of the sense on how, how it happens. And then you go one step further and, and you can zoom in even more and having a sense of the ground. Uh, and that's what I consider, that's one example on how we, we, we show stories in Infamazonia, but that's, for me, it's a good summary of what geojournalism is like, because then you have on the, the left side, you're zooming in on a territory. This is an indigenous territory and telling the story of this indigenous territory through data. So you can see what's the name of that uh, indigenous land, what's the kind of, uh, the name of the people who live there that are the Shabanti, how many inhabitants of this indigenous land exist, 960, the official area. And in uh, yellow and green, you see when the deforestation uh, and the forest fires happen within the, that indigenous territory. You see the areas uh, being deforested in the recent years. And then you get the story on the right side. That's what I was saying, like you're creating this dialogue between the data and the story by geolocating your story in that, your, in that territory. So you're combining the data with the story. Hopefully this is a, a it's a, a very comprehensive, very in-depth way of telling people about that specific character, that place. So my character here would be this indigenous territory. I want to show the trends of the first stations within who is living there and also telling the latest with the story. By the end of years of collecting stories, that's um, how I believe we've done a good job of representing this very complex territory. We're talking about again territory the size of the European Union with ver various nuances like indigenous several indigenous ethnicities, different languages and cultures and so on. But then over the years, the objective, the, the goal was creating this collection of stories of journalists from many countries. So you're creating a network as well of contributors, of people that will help you to literally map the territory, tell the story of the territory. So we can say in that way that journalists can be even consider <laughs> modern cartographers. It's a way of mapping. 
pay attention that very often when we're doing environmental stories or talking about the investigative projects we're talking, we would like to map the actors of this area. We would like to map the main crimes, environmental crimes of the recent years. For me, this is very symptomatic of the way we want to see, literally see things, you know, like we want to give to our audience a map that is comprehensive, is an overview. So think about creating and collecting a collection of stories. Uh, <clears throat> some examples here, um, I will, sh I, I can share this uh, presentation with you guys, but then uh, you will have time to explore better, but I will show one example, one example from the, from ProPublica that you probably know in, in the US, look how interesting this story is, it's, it's very similar to what I was showing. It's done with the newspaper in Louisiana. So here they want to show how the coast of Louisiana is it's actually disappeared since the uh, nine, 1920s because of climate change or some misuse of the land. So it gives you the territory, but you can remember, you can zoom in, like I was saying, and then you getting closer to some areas. And so you have the story here on the side, it tells you the story. At the same time, you have the uh, slider here that shows the reduction of the terrain. Look at this, how dramatic. From the 930s from now, that's how much water has intruded the territory in this specific area to the point that there's no more land uh, by 2010. And for giving more context to this, you know, you tell the story here on the on the right side with all the things that I'm pretty sure you know, like with podcasts, with videos, with the interviews, mood media, more data here. But look, it's the same kind of visual or language that I was just mentioning in my in my work at the Infamazonia. On the left side, you have the data to contextualize the territory and the right side you have the you have the 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 story itself another amazing example oops which connects with my my next step uh, is this story done by the guardian of nigeria with the support of the pulitzer center coordinated by uh, this initiative called code for africa and this is amazing. It's a it's a story about Makoko that if we have friends from Nigeria and Lagos here, I'm pretty sure they know a lot about it. But Makoko is a floating uh, neighborhood in Lagos, which literally is not in the map. Uh, it's uh, not a regular neighborhood or community. So that's why it's not on Google Maps literally. So this story is amazing because they've done two works at the same time. They collected geographic data, they created a database. They're not working with a ready-made database. And at the same time, they were telling the story of this character. So the main character here, of course, the people are showing the story, but the character is the neighborhood is Makoko itself. So it needs to be mapped as, as well as its people. So let me just get to the, the main part. Look at this, how amazing is this story? Um, so this is Google Maps and you see Makoko is just basically a white uh, blank spot in the, in the map. But here's the, the map they created after this story, all their neighborhoods that are here mapped with OpenStreetMap which is a tool that helps people to, it's a wiki, a, a Wikipedia of the maps, but allows people to create their own features on the map. And so people from the community themselves were helping to map their, their features. And this is the interesting data that they collect, how much boat terminals exist, how many church exist in the, in the neighborhood, a health facility, head of community, mosque, market, that's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a map, it's a story at the same time. Amazing example from, from Code for Africa. So how you, would you start to do such a work? My first tip for you 
as a, a practical thing is to learn how to geolocate yourself. Have you ever used a GPS or an application like Wikiloc? It's not a, a propaganda here. It's just like a nice app that I, I've used in my own work, but there's so other in iPhone or Android that you can use as GPS applications for your phone. Your phone very likely has a, a GPS built in. Um, that's why you can use these apps, but a professional GPS might be a good thing to have as well if you're doing work on, on the ground, on different, on, on distant and remote environments. And so I would say that the first step for you start doing this kind of work of mixing geographic data with your own stories is learn how to geolocate your content. It can be your uh, track, how you geolocate the movement that you do, like from um, using a car or making a, a, a hike or taking a boat, or even putting geographic coordinates in your uh, uh, pictures and other content like video. Quick example on how I've used this myself, and, and I'll show you then um, an exercise. So I did a story for Info Amazonia about this hydroelectric power plant called Belo Monte years ago. And for this story, I was lucky to go in on a boat, like a canoe, with indigenous people from the Xingu River in Brazil. So the idea was taking the canoe and rowing for four days with the local people. This, this was my guide showing how the new hydroelectric power plant would impact their livelihoods. There, these are fishermen and people who depend on the river. And the main thing was that, as you know, because we have so many cases in, in, in the countries that you are coming from, I know, um, of hydroelectric power plants changing the pulse of the river, basically putting, creating an unnatural regime of the flow. And all the way through the trip, we were seeing scenes like this. This is not illegal deforestation, that's legal for it. Um, avoiding methane uh, emissions. So they were cutting all the trees that would be flooded of the area that would be flooded. So I was, while I was growing <laughs> and doing the, the trip, I was with my GPS connected and mapping everything. So I was putting this as a point of interest, taking pictures with coordinates and so on and so on. We got to this point where there was a, a 20 kilometers canal that would take water to the turbines and finally got to the main uh, dam uh, with the canoes, you can see the canoes, to, to see uh, where the, the water would be locked. At this point, it was not closed yet, the dam. And so the story was all about these indigenous people wanting to show <laughs> how the river was before the closing of the dam. As I said, all the way I was doing Tracking is not a super intuitive map, but it's to show you how I've worked with the data that I collected on the ground. So in red, you have my track of the trip, 100 kilometers in the Shignu River. All the spins are the the first station areas that I saw. Um, you you see the scar in the middle of the image. That's that canal, the 20 kilometers canal. So there's a, another layer here, which is this updated satellite image which you show the scar of the canal and so on and so on. And there's even an orange on the bottom. I'm not sure it's totally seeable, but these are the indigenous territories of the people who are guiding us to show how uh, by diverting the water through the canal, they would stay without water. Um, so from, from this, when you get all this data, you can start building this stories with layers. Here's a quick tip about the data formats that we'll find and have to work. So you have the vector data and the raster data, basically uh, points, polygons, and lines, and satellite imagery. These are the two kind of data. So you will find data in table formats like the CSV that I'm pretty sure you all know. But there's other that are very common to, to this practice of doing maps. It's either shape file, ASHP and GeoJSON or GPX. GPX is the, the format that you get from your 
from your uh, GPS and others that will work on Google Earth and Google Maps like PML and PMZ. Just so you know. Here's some uh, tips for doing uh, exercises, if you like. And I'm, I'm going to uh, live show one exercise and then you can um, try yourselves. This is a pretty, pretty simple. Uh, there is this uh, time lapse um, tool called Earth Engine, where remember I, I mentioned think about a place that you want to talk or you want to tell a story about, and then see how this place has changed over the years. That's possible to do with Google Earth Pro and the Google Earth Engine, uh, which is a very good tool from Google. But if you go to this tool, it's called Earth Engine, as I mentioned, uh, and there's the time lapse. You can get this perspective of change. Remember the glacier that I, I just showed you in the first slide? You can get 40 years of sidelight imagery and see how this place has changed over the years. You know, this kind of you know, like animation, kind of GIF language. And on this tool, you can search anything that you like. You can search a state on your country or like a, a place. So if I go to Brazil, I will see areas of the first station. So this is my first tip for you in terms of seeking for change. Like I want to see if the places I'm, I'm, I'm looking at are changing over the years. And and you can do this both on this time lapse, but then you can use uh, Google Earth Pro. I would say this is possibly one of the best tools for you to use. But then you can show the changes uh, over time. And get right back to my, my presentation. So here's my, my suggestion. Think about a place, go to these two tools, either Google Earth Engine time lapse or Google Earth Pro and show the changes over time. And then exercise two, start overlaying others, other uh, information like the forestation, forest fires and protected areas. Then a second step, a second exercise, it would be using satellite imagery itself, which you can find for free in, in Sentinel Hub and Planet to platforms. So if you go to this website on this link, and I will soon get this link on our chat, uh, you can find many, many uh, images that give you updated information about this territory. Same thing for these tools of NASA. I know my time is a bit short. Let me just go over some of the sources that I was just mentioning. So the time lapse of Google Earth Engine, and now have the one from uh, the European Space Agency where you get imagery that even allow you to do this time lapse. The good thing is that Sentinel, the Google Earth engine thing is using Landsat, which is a great imagery because of the time span it goes back to the 80s. But Sentinel Hub has better results. Sentinel satellite from the European Space Agency has better um, resolution 10 meters and you can see more things. One tool that gives you a lot of the other layers like protected areas, forest fires, deforestation for the whole globe is Global Forest Watch. Not sure if you use it, but then from here you can download many of those formats like I was showing the CSV, the GPS, uh, the sorry, the ASET, uh, the shapefile, the KML, you get these formats and then you start creating your own maps. For creating your own maps, you can either use Google Earth Pro, uh, but I really like two tools. That one is QGIS and another is Mapbox. Then you start putting the layers there. To get fire data, you can use this platform from NASA. It's called NASA Firms. And finally, to see even uh, imagery from the impact of forest fires or pollution in the air, you can use this tool, it's called WordView from NASA, that gives you 
other indicators like uh, carbon monoxide, or even carbon dioxide, other uh, particulates, kind of more atmospherical sciences when you can see the pollution directly from the satellite imagery. And some links for those as well are here. My contacts, I'll leave the, the link for the presentation and you will have um, how to click over those links and access those um, tools. And I'll be happy to answer any questions here and, and after. Thank you, Gustavo. Thanks a lot. Uh, Gustavo, is it possible for you to uh, show us uh, either exercise one or exercise two right now? Can you quickly show us, take us through? Uh, one of those exercises, you mean? One of the exercises, yeah. Just to see how it feels to actually go through it, if, if it is possible. Yes, sure. Um, so I'm seeing the, the, the question. This is the presentation I just shared, and I'm seeing the presentation. Um, uh, uh, the, the Google Earth Pro is free. Yeah, it is free. Let me share again the on the on my screen. I'll put it on on Google Earth. Can you see the Google Earth? Uh, not yet. Not yet. It will, yeah, we can see it. No, it's fine. Okay. okay. Let me get things. Oops. I'm just trying to organize because there's so many screens uh, on the top. Wait. Mm. Okay. All right. So, Gorf. Uh, is uh, pro is free and and you can and my my mouse is is somehow So it's free and allow you to upload. So I'm, here's the, the picture of Brazil. What I, I, I'm putting here is one track, the KML track uh, of that same trip that I was showing you. So for doing this, you can open, sorry, it's in Portuguese here, but Abrir is open. Um, you can open a file as any other file. It just needs to be a, either a shape file or a KML. In this case, I'm using a KML that I took from my GPS. So I'm calling here Shingo Track. And once I open, it, it takes me directly to that track as I was showing you. So this is the boat trip that I did. All of this was tracked on my, on my GPS. And you can connect your GPS directly here on Google Earth Pro, and it shows you the track. So from now, what I'm going to do here is to explore the territory and see the changes. So one thing that you can do is using the tool here on the top. You see there is a menu of tools. And there is a small camera even here that you can record your movements. But there is this clock with a green arrow on the top. This clock, it's... It's a great uh, tool. It's, it allows you to look over time. So this is the, the hydroelectric power plant, Belo Monte, ready. Look at the lake, right? If I turn off the clock as my track that was made five years ago, it will show how was the same place five years ago. Look, the lake's not there. Uh, the whole thing is not ready. So, but when I click the clock, it will give me a, a historical perspective of that place. Now I can see the lake. I can see the channel, it's full, right? And you can see that down here where the indigenous people live is where 
it's drier. That was exactly the story. They were saying like when the hydroelectric power plant is closed, we're gonna lose the water downstream. And look what you can do with this clock. You can go back and see when they were building, the river was still flowing without being blocked. Um, and even before they started the build, you can see how was the area without the channel and everything. But if you go back to the, the day today, you see very well how the lake was created, the channel diverting water. And even here, you can do other things that are very interesting, like, for example, you can uh, measure things. Remember the kind of analysis that you can do. You can measure the size of this wall. For example, I know the hydroelectric power plant, for example, has roughly three kilometers of size by just using the ruler here. Of course, this is not super precise because I'm just drawing a line, but it gives you an idea of the scale of this big thing. And then comes the other parts of it, which is opening new layers. Let me open a new one and showing, for example, Oops, the indigenous territory. And so I have to, if you choose the kind of, of, of file I'm gonna open, you have shape file here, for example, and I can, when I, I use shape file, I can find it, the file that I was using. It's gonna show me the indigenous territory on the bottom. So it gives me the polygon of that indigenous territory. And as you can see, this is the story I was telling. You know, like the water started to be diverted to this channel on the north of the image, taking water from this indigenous territory huh, here on the south. And and like this, I started putting more and more. So I want to see what's the uh, the trend of deforestation after the dam was built and so on. I'll keep putting more and more uh, satellite uh, information or other layers to understand the territory. You can even put a, uh, um, overlay a satellite imagery directly here. It is possible to do so. Uh, for example, one last thing before I hear more questions. If I go back to my data set here, just a sec. I got a, a Sentinel. Uh, satellite imagery on that website. Oh, that one is is not loading. I'm sorry. Let me try another. This is another area that I visit years ago. And I, I did a story about this specific place. It's called um, Realidade. So if I want to see the deforestation rate here, I just scan. You can just overlay the polygons of the, of that area and see, you know, all these white spots here are deforestation polygons. Sorry, it's not loading really quick. I think because it's using Zoom and, and Google Earth Pro at the same time. But that allow me now. You see, you know, like all these polygons. Colorful polygons are recent areas of deforestation. This data is actually coming from, from the Brazilian government. So this allows me to plan my trip ahead. I want to visit the areas that there were most recent deforestation happening. So even not to tell the story, but to plan the stories ahead, I use this tool. It's like visiting the place before I go there. And so I get all these small uh, deforestation polygons and plan for the for the trip. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay.
Yeah. So there are some questions that are there in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm, thank you, Randy. Hopefully you can do good work with this. Um, uh, for him, him and Shu, um, how to create these different types of files and how to create this data set and layers. Most of these layers will be ready for you to use in these formats on the data repository. So if you go to Sentinel Hub, you will be able, for example, to download satellite images in these formats and already use it. Same thing goes for Global Forest Watch and many others. All the NASA data repositories will already find these data files. So if you go to the uh, firm's website, which is Forest, Forest Fires Data, they will offer you information already on table format, shape file format, and so on. Now, if you want to create a layer like the guys from the Guardian Nigeria did, if you want to create a, a map, a, a, a database for a map yourself collecting data, the, the best way of doing this is creating a spreadsheet. That's the most common kind of data set that we'll create. That means that you can even create a, a spreadsheet for your stories. That's pretty much how we started the information. You create a spreadsheet and then you create your categories. It's like this story, the name of the author, the date when it was created, the description, the links for the media of that story. In that way, you're collecting information for, for creating a collection of stories. And that applies for anything. If you're mapping something and you're using a GPS, you're creating a data set yourself. Why are you... Turning on your GPS, you're creating a track like the one I showed in a KML format or a GPX format, and then you export from your application and you have this data set. Are there any other questions, queries uh, that, you want, uh, that any of the participants want to know? I'll do a chat I think the man who really wants to, has a lot of questions. So can you also answer this? How do we prepare the tracks on, on that? Yeah, well, the, the preparing, it's more about visualizing, I think. You can, once you open the file, it's gonna be there. So there's not much to prepare. Suppose you were using the track from a GPS, the GPS is doing the work and the, and the precision comes from this, right? There, registering those points and creating a line that you in theory you don't need to to uh, interfere or change what you can do is uh, change the color or select parts of it um, so you can prepare what what you can do always with the data set is to clean the data set before you visualize in the sense that you go into a spreadsheet and you erase some rows or erase and eliminate that column that you don't want it to show. So preparing in a sense is to future and, and decide what to show, what is more important to prioritize. Uh, a very basic question I have to start. Uh, if somebody starting off with this, is Google Earth Pro a better software than QGIS or RGIS or, 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 the, or the likes? I think they are very complementary because Google Earth Pro has very good uh, uh, satellite imagery capacities. So it's good for doing that comparisons over time, like I want to show before and after. And, and it's very, Google Earth Pro is a very good place to start, really, because it works like a GIS software, like QGIS or ArcGIS. It has some kind of the same. Uh, uh, rationale, you know, like piling layers and using the same formats. So I would start using Google Earth Pro, which is free and gives you a lot of insights. It's a good, as I was saying, like before going to do a story on the ground, I often go on Google Earth and, and study the, the place there. Now, QGIS and ArcGIS are similar and professional uh, GIS software. While ArcGIS is uh, uh, paid and more uh, powerful in a way because it's 
the pioneer of all the uh, GIS softwares. QGIS is very good and free. And there, the, the main thing with these two softwares is your capacity of doing analysis, really in-depth analysis. So there are so many things that you can do, for example, then getting a high resolution satellite imagery there, extracting information from the imagery. So suppose you get a raw satellite imagery from, from Sentinel, which is medium resolution, 10 meters, and you want to calculate yourself the deforestation of that area of that area in the past month. You can do this on QGIS by, you know, like vectorizing the satellite imagery and extracting the polygons and creating yourself the polygons. Uh, the other things you can measure is um, the intersection of points and polygons, for example. So I'm just mentioning some of the analysis. If you want to count how many points exist within the polygon, like for example, which are the forest uh, protected areas that are more affected by forest fires, you intersect these two layers on QGIS and demand the QGIS to do this calculation for you. So it's an analytical tool in that sense. Can the data sets or layers that are uh, readily available be used for specific locations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trey, so in, yeah, you, you, the, you can get the, in all these tools, um, suppose you go to Sentinel Hub or Planet Explorer, that are tools for downloading satellite imagery. The best thing is actually you download the specific location instead of downloading the whole planet because that would be really, really heavy. So you go into the tools and say, like, I want to look at um, New Delhi or Sao Paulo, one specific city, and then you download it just that area, which is good, or even one factory. But that depends really on the resolution, pretty much like you said. Um, we have now uh, with Sentinel medium resolution picture uh, satellite imagery for free. Sometimes when you have a specific event, like extreme event, like a flood in Germany or forest fires in California, and so on and so on, uh, Google release high resolution imagery through Google Earth Pro. So if you start looking at that specific location on Google Earth Pro, uh, you might find high resolution imagery, which is two meters resolution. But usually it's better getting to the community. There is a community of Google Earth users that you can easily find by searching on, on Google that will announce when this satellite imagery are available for free. So it's a work of, of researching. Uh, the good news is a lot of these companies like Planet, Digital Globe, Airbus, who are doing high resolution imagery, they're very keen of working with journalists. So you can reach out to them and say like, look, I work for this media outlet. We're doing this story. We need the site high resolution imagery. They will very likely release it to you. And from that data set, you can do many other work. My pleasure. I thought there was an, a, a previous question uh, about the yeah, one point of interest in your map, how we can do that. Well, that's that's um, that's straightforward. Either you search, as I was saying, for that specific point, I want to look at one specific city, like you search on Google Maps, and that will point out to you on all the tools that specific place, or you can take the pin and pin down. Literally, you can take the pin either in Google Maps. Um, there's one thing that it's, it's nice to do. I can share quickly my screen again and go back to the to this uh, look. If I, I suppose if you all have Google Drive, you can see my Google Drive here, right? So in Google Drive, there is a surprise, which is when you go here on new and you go to more, there's one thing that's called Google My Maps. 
So Google My Maps is different from Google Maps. And it is, it is a map that you can edit. And so I'm opening here. I'm not sure you've ever seen this, but so Google My Maps, you can literally take a pin and put it anywhere you want. And that starts creating your own map. And then you can say like, it's my point of interest. You can even start mapping your stories. So say like, okay, this is my first story. Then I want to create my second story. And you could start collecting points over a map. I, I love doing this because I love maps, as you probably noticed at this point. So I, I let's say like I have my map of my favorite trips I ever done. Um, so I, I put my point here, then I upload my pictures. So if I want to share with my family or my my friends, I just show oh here's are my trips of 2020, and then there's a few points over the map. Well, 2020, I I didn't. It didn't go anywhere much <laughs> so that because there was everybody was locked down but that kind of thing you can put it like a, a collection of your stories over time so google my maps is pretty straightforward pretty intuitive you can create geo stories if you like and the way of doing this is using your google drive again going here for creating a new document and go to more, it will show you here, Google My Maps. No questions? Okay. Thanks, Gustavo. Thanks a lot for the session. We learned Thanks, a lot. Thank you. And the last example is the best example that he showed for all of us. How to map our stories on Google My Maps. <laughs> 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 wonderful yeah please do it's very it's it's a lot of fun and, and just one last I do think so, so now i have three options google earth pro qgis and apps if i have to start with a beginner what do you prefer google earth pro is the thing best thing to start with as a beginner i think so i think either google earth pro or the google even this last example the google my maps i think it's a good place to start because they're really intuitive and then move to qgis the arcgis unless you get a free uh, account for you as an individual or your organization your university or your media uh, newsroom uh, pay for it it's it's tough to 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 work because it's very it's very expensive basically but it's a great software so if you have the chance of getting access it, it's it's great but again i would recommend as if you have not used these tools yet to start with google Earth pro thank you so thank you thanks once again for thank you karen it was a pleasure and thank you everybody and please feel free to get in contact if you have any other <laughs> doubts sure thanks a lot Thanks, have a great day and evening. Ciao.